welcome to the Writing um, Careers panel today, which is going to focus on careers that involve a lot of writing, but isn't going to cover creative writing, as in writing a novel. Um, so a very, very warm welcome to our speakers who have generously given us their time today. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, Christina Lau, who is a senior technical writer at Microfocus. Um, Frankie Barber, creative copywriter at Agency Inc. Chris Henley, who's senior leadership communications specialist at QDAR, in other words, a speech writer. And also Gwilym Sims Williams, who is a YouTube consultant and digital writer. I'm Catherine Alexander, one of the careers consultants at the Career Service. And my colleague, Diane Caldwell, will be helping manage the questions towards the end of, of the session today. So first of all, we're going to start with each speaker speaking a little bit about their role and a little bit about what a typical day might look like, if there is such a thing. Um, and then prompted by some questions, we're going to go into the panel discussion part of the event. And there will be, as I said, plenty of time for questions from the audience. So um, if we start with Christina first, um, what does a typical day look like for you? So. Um... I write manuals for software mainly. So depending on where we are in the release cycle, it can be a little bit different, but usually it involves finding out what a new feature is from development or writing release notes for bug fixes. Um, if there's a new feature, then I have to talk to the developers to figure out what it does and what it's supposed to do. And um, I sometimes act as a bit of a user advocate at that stage and say, like, is this really the useful thing that it should be doing is there a way we can make it easier for people to use um, but then once that stage is ironed out it's going off and writing for customers how to use the feature um, most of the stuff that I work on is pretty mature products so it's adding new little features rather than writing whole new documents but we do a bit of that too when there's a new um, a new product coming out um, but for new features that's sort of adding bits onto documentation or modifying existing stuff. Um, there's a lot of talking to the developers and figuring out how to translate what they've done into something that the customers can use and understand. Um, and yeah, beyond that, there's sort of other little projects we try and take on to try and improve older documentation, which doesn't sort of fall directly within the release cycle. And that has sort of trying to prioritize that alongside the stuff that we need to get done for a particular release can be quite fun um but that's sort of like the main part of my job and I really like the sort of like the explaining how to do something to people part of my work okay thank you thank you very much um and just going around my screen in the order that you're here um Chris so I would say in terms of a typical day, there really isn't one. And this is um, this is kind of the nature of the roles. Writing speeches, it can be very feast or famine because there isn't always a speech a day. Um, you don't always know what's coming. Uh, so for me, I'm either bored witless waiting for feedback to come in um, on a project or um, I've got everything flying at me all at once because things are happening at the last minute and um, and so suddenly somebody's remembered that they need to brief the speechwriter. My favorite uh, my favorite email that I get from people is um, so how's the speech going? And I say, what speech? Because they've forgotten to <laughs> sound like the last person to find out about these things. So um, so, or I am delightfully and pleasantly busy. So it's it's going to be one of those three. And from day to day, you just don't know. But the, the nice thing about my role um, is that it really has evolved. And I think that that is what happens when, um, when you're good at what you do and when people realize that you're quite good at writing. And so today, for example, um, I've been working on a few speeches. But I've also been um, working on a, um, a commemorative book 
for the outgoing vice chancellor and co-chairs of um, a, the fundraising campaign. And I've been working on a, a blurb for a title in a blurb for um, an alumni event. And I've been working on a fundraising narrative for the business school at Cambridge. So, um, so on the downtime, when you're not working on speeches, and people, you become kind of a default writing expert. Um, and that can be loads of fun because if you love to write, you're just writing everything. And um, so there's, there's no typical day um, and it can't, that can be frustrating. It's hard to plan, but um, I, I think for somebody who loves to write, it's a, it's a great role. Wow, sounds extremely varied. Um, it is, it yeah, is. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, next, Gwilym. Yeah, so um, sometimes I get blank looks when I say I'm a YouTube consultant or writer. People are like, usually are like, uh, wait, YouTubers don't write their own stuff. Um, the thing is, once, once creators, and I'm including not just YouTubers, but people who have blogs or whatever, once they get big enough, it becomes this um, huge operation where they need help from people to write things, to... Uh, I suppose, um, make content consistently and well. Um, I suppose my work is split into four main areas. So firstly, I consult with people to help them improve their YouTube channels. Secondly, I write YouTube scripts with people. So someone will get in touch and maybe say, hey, I want to write a script about uh, whatever it is. Can you help me craft uh, sort of an engaging video I'll talk to you, you will write things up, maybe do some research. Um, and yeah, YouTube script writing is a specific, uh, uh, is a specific craft that, uh, where you need to get certain things right that are yeah, specific to YouTube. Um, thirdly, I help people write newsletters. So uh, a lot of creators have maybe uh, like a weekly newsletter that they send out that people can sign up to. And that is their, um, that is their sort of the main link that they have to the audience that they own. So if you have an email list, uh, you can connect with those people whenever you like. You are not reliant on Google or Facebook or YouTube or whoever controlling your access to your own audience. So yeah, people want to build up a newsletter list most of the time, but they don't always have time to write their own emails. Um, and finally, I do uh, ghostwriting on Twitter. So uh, again, similar, a client will talk to me about what it is that they want to say regularly, but maybe they don't have the time to write that stuff all themselves. So my normal work day is a mishmash of all those different things. And also, uh, if, you, if you're working freelance, you also have to manage your own workload and negotiate with clients and put some time into, um, yeah, finding new clients if you want. Again, there's a theme coming through here that, that variety is, is key in these, in these kinds of roles. Um, and Frankie? Yeah, so I guess it's probably easiest to fight. There's quite, there are quite a lot of different types of copywriters, so the industry can be a bit, a bit tricky to understand. Um, so I guess your extremes if anyone's seen like um, Mad Men would be like Don Draper is the extreme and way over glamorized version of, of like an agency copywriter which is basically what I am well much less glamorous than that is what I'm saying but um but I guess obviously the definition is kind of that you're writing words for marketing or advertising and within an agency which is the environment I work in that would be you'll have lots of different clients um, and those clients do all sorts of different things. So you might have, if you're Don Draper, you might have like, I don't know, some beautiful department store. And then I don't know, in his case, probably something like cigarettes, which probably would be a bit, um, yeah, very sixties, but um, at our place, um, I do business to business. So it's more, um, quite complicated technical services which one business is trying to sell to another um, but within that there are again quite a lot of types of copywriting and what I do is more on the it's called conceptual so it would just mean that you're kind of working on 
the initial ideas um, for a an advertising campaign or for a marketing campaign. Um, so I guess practically that would come down to, you know, day to day, you'd sit down. Um, the, a company, one of your clients would bring the agency as a whole, um, a big sort of question, a big brief. So it might be, we want to launch this product or we want to do this or something else. And um, strategists and account managers and people would work really hard on that brief for a long time. And then it would come to me on one morning um, and I would sit down with uh, the person I work most closely with, who is an art director. So an art director would be just an ideas person, but um, someone who thinks very visually and, and is very skilled visually. Um, and together we'd try and come up with an idea. So something a bit bigger than just a headline, something that's going to run through lots of different types of headlines, lots of different types of um, ad something that can apply in lots of different situations um, and then ultimately once we've come up with that idea if the client likes it um, which is a question in and of itself um, you then would write assets for that so by assets that's a kind of a horrible industry word but I just mean stuff <laughs> maybe like a, a kind of a, like um, video script um, or you might write uh, an infographic or anything that might fall out of it. But I guess with the role I'm in currently as a conceptual writer, it would generally be the stuff where the visuals and the words need to work quite closely together. So it would be something like a video script. It would be something like an ad itself, um, whether that's on social or somewhere else. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's the, the basics of the day to day. Um, Right, thank you, thank you all four of you. Um, really varied, um, really different ways of writing for, for each one of you as well in the, in the way that you create the content that you do each day. Um, now, many, many students come to the career service saying that they like writing and they want it to be a big part of, of their career. And what they've been writing so far has been writing academic essays, creative writing for pleasure, student journalism, that kind of thing. Um, and they want a career that involves writing to some degree. Is the writing that you do in your role similar to anything that you did as a student? Or have you had to develop a really different set of writing skills as you started your career? Um, whoever wants to jump in first. I'll, I'll go, I'm happy to go. Um, I would say that it's very different to what I did as a student, but it doesn't matter because good writing is good writing. And um, so if you can structure a persuasive essay, if you can tell a story, um, if you can write from notes in an exam, if you can research a paper, if you can explain a thesis, like um, it's all the same skills. And um, from, I would say that if you love to write, that get a job writing anything because it and, and expand into it because you will learn so much. Um, I feel like writing skills are so transferable um, and so flexible and um, so learning, say, to write video scripts or um, learning to write, uh, say, tweets and, and posts for social media. Te all of everything teaches you so much about writing and it's so transferable. Um, so I would say, yeah, just, just write in any way you can. And, and um, you know, you will, I think it will, uh, they all feed each other. Yeah, I would really echo that because um, technical writing isn't exactly like essay writing at all. It's not like writing procedures in chemistry which is where I came from um, but the skills sort of like constructing a sentence constructing a paragraph and going from there to constructing an argument or an instruction set it all comes back to the same skill set and even in a I think most people could stand to learn to write better because even just things like emails it's amazing how much difference it can make having a well-constructed argument in an email it saves so much time for everyone. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest difference was um, when I started writing 
as, as as work and when you get that very instant feedback of how many views did this video get how many like uh readers are tuning in every week to read your email suddenly uh yeah you, you, it's you realize very quickly that what turns people off is uh writing that isn't clear writing that is trying to impress as opposed to communicate something writing where it's clear that the person doesn't care that much about what they're writing about um so in my line of work you've got to uh yeah emphasize uh like understandability and make things that might be complicated immediately accessible i think that's probably true for all for all of us yeah yeah that's definitely something that that really resonates with me as well i think it's it is that sort of element of well, I think in copywriting, and I would imagine this might be similar in what you do, but you have to have a kind of, you want people to feel something. And maybe in an academic context, you write more um, descriptively sometimes. And it certainly like feeling is more effective um, in a marketing or advertising context, certainly. So, um, uh, but also just can be more engaging. So I think that's a difference, but at the same time, as um, people have mentioned, you know, clarity and expression. I think also, you know, great writing is kind of great thinking in a way, regardless. So if you get the thinking really clear and neat, then you will have you'll have good writing, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. Um, with, with that in mind, um, for students who obviously have to write in a really academic way and get in the habit of that because they're doing a degree, after all, that's why they're at Cambridge, um, what can they do whilst they're at the university to develop these uh, different ways of writing alongside their academic writing? I mean, uh, I would say, um, obviously I would say this, but start writing online like start a blog or a or keep have a constant Twitter presence or even Instagram captions, things like this. If you get into the habit of writing that about something that you enjoy, not only will your writing improve, but um, it's just yeah, it's just fun. And at the end of it, you will have um, a portfolio that will probably deeply impress someone in the future. Uh, I did some travel writing when I was doing my undergraduate at Edinburgh and uh, it only took like maybe a few, like maybe like an hour every week. But uh, later on, I was so thankful that I'd done that because um, it just adds up to a lot after a few years. Yeah. I would agree. I would say have ideas and write about them, whether that's a blog or um social media and 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 to practice and also to i mean obviously as students um you do this but to read to read for recreation and to be able to identify what good writing is for you and why and and um yes so i would say you know a love of reading just a love of language um and and to to practice practice the writing practice the uh, putting the ideas on paper yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Um, reading and writing. Just practice whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's doodling or if it's writing an essay or a story. It's all good practice. I have to say I didn't do much of it. I, I Well, I wrote huge amounts as part of my degree, but I didn't. I only wrote for myself. And it's interesting hearing, you know, this online now you do have that. You always have that recourse you can self-publish basically um but yeah writing every day trying different styles would be I think just the ultimate way of doing it from my point of view but thank you um this is this event is is obviously part of uh, a bigger creative careers festival um I think that some of you probably have more creativity in the writing that you do every day than others but how much scope do you really have to, to let your, your imagination go wild and really be creative in the jobs that you do? I think my job is, is really, really creative within um, a certain kind of structure. Um, I have a lot of freedom to 
to, to go and, and research a topic, to express it. in because one thing, one thing you find with writing for at, at people at like executive level, they just don't have the time to think about this. And they are so grateful if you've done the thinking for them. So I go off and listen to podcasts maybe about the topic and, um, uh, and, and, and that all feeds into, um, making a speech say with with real substance and um i think a, a, a couple of good examples of of how creative you have to be sometimes is in the past i've had to write closing remarks for um a event that hasn't taken place yet so you have to imagine what might have happened and based on what might have happened what your boss might want to say about it from what you know about his or her voice and um I'm routinely given a couple of words about an event and asked to come up with a really zippy title and a description and to do it, you know, very, very quickly. And you just, you can really, um, you can really just kind of unleash your creativity. So I think, um, you know, within, within the structure of the job um, of, of speech writing um, and, and the other writing that I do, it's uh, uh yeah, it's it's amazingly creative and it's just great fun. Um, yeah, I, I think um, similarly for me, it, it, there's a lot of creativity involved. Um, I think for my line of work, particularly if you're writing a YouTube script, you also need to be, you need to have like an internal editor brain switched on as well, where you're thinking, what are the visuals? What's happening here? Uh, how can we say something with images that we don't need to put into words? How can we um, how can we have someone saying something and make the visuals something that uh, um, I guess emphasizes that or, or, or adds extra context? Um, so that's a lot of fun. Um, also, I think this is going to be more and more of a thing in the next five ten years. But um, AI writing is getting very impressive and. I think if you want to uh, make it as a writer, you're going to have to be able to lean into like weird stuff that goes on in your brain, um, stuff that uh, other human beings are going to connect with, uh, draw on your own experiences of life. And yeah, just lean into the human element because in, in 10 years time, the AI will be able to write very, very good copy and uh, kind of, informational style writing but it won't necessarily be able to uh pick up things from the modern human experience and express them in a new way necessarily i don't think hopefully let's see <laughs> yeah i think it, that is really interesting because definitely within what i do you sort of come through you get more creative in my experience as you go through you probably enter certainly a marketing or advertising agency role where you're writing and you're executing other people's ideas to some extent there's still creativity in the sense that obviously anytime you're trying to present information differently you do want to be leaning into that sort of um your personal style in small ways um just because you know that's the you, you can't be someone else so you might as well <laughs> be you is one of the things but also you know you just want to add as much value as you can and that makes writing more engaging I think but as I've moved through certainly the the role that I've got now is um because you just get a blank sheet of paper that is that is quite creative and and I find um those areas where you are thinking about how it interacts with um with something that might be on screen or how can you say something um with images um that I think is a really rich place from my point of view to be as creative as possible. But I think there's always room for creativity when you're writing kind of whatever, uh, whatever your role is personally. Yeah, I think this is the bit where technical writing kind of loses out to these other different writing careers because it's if I'm writing fiction, then I'm doing it wrong. Um, so I, sort of, I don't have as much opportunity to really stretch my creative legs in a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff like if I'm documenting a feature I have to say what it does and we usually have to use a style guide and house style so it has to be fairly 
the, the aim of a technical writer is to be invisible. So you're saying bring your own style in technical writing. It's kind of the opposite. You have to be as plain speaking as possible because that's how people will learn to understand that. But within that, you also you do get to find the best ways of explaining something. You need to find the right examples to help people really get what a feature does, what it's for. And as I've advanced in my role, I'm doing slightly less of that sort of day to day crunching features and more other things like I've do, been doing some technical blogging and um, that kind of thing and that's a lot more creative because I have to pick from a wide range of subjects and try and synthesize it into something really clear and simple in a sort of more open format so it doesn't it isn't stuck in to a guide somewhere where it has to follow this same structure and that does start to exercise the creativity a little bit more um, but it's not the same as sort of creating something from nothing I'm working with an existing framework and I have to um, stick within that and I can't really go outside of what a product does because then I would be doing my job. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, now obviously this is a, is a panel about writing but all jobs have a need for multiple skills um, and aside from the ability to write in a role appropriate way what, what other skills do you do you all have that sit around that that are necessary to allow the writing to happen? I, I was trying to think about that and I really, I couldn't come up with any skills, but I did come up with one quality that I think is helpful, which is curiosity. I think that um, if you are someone who's curious about the world around you, it, I think that really um, supports and informs um, a writing job, um, especially if it if it does have an element of of creativity to it. Um, I would say, and and also what I was saying before about social media, um, for example, on Twitter, if you if you learn to um, how to get a idea across in a compelling way in 280 characters or something you know that's a rare skill um which most people think they can do and they really can't so i i think um the the skills of particular maybe niche forms of writing like that are are useful to have a look at yeah i think, I think oh, sorry you go ahead christina yeah i was gonna say this is the soft skills is the sort of the, the sort of stuff around writing, the general communication skills. In in my job in particular, I think I have to communicate with lots of different people of all sorts of different communication styles. Some of them don't like talking to people at all. Others are overly chatty and want to come over to my desk and tell me things in person, which I can't then write down and use because it's just all in the air. Um, so we sort of just have to work with that and like you to try and find the right way of approaching all the individual people that I have to get information out of and that kind of skill set is quite important in a lot of different roles I think. Um, uh, for me uh, probably um, data analysis which sounds dry as heck but but um, if you have a YouTube channel, you can click on YouTube analytics and there is this huge dashboard that tells you when, how many people clicked, what type of people are clicking. You have a, a retention graph, which basically is a line goes down from at the beginning of your video, 100% 100, 100 of people are watching and then it goes down and it inevitably goes down, but you need to figure out why did it go down more at one point? Why did you hold people's attention at another point? You need to get into the mind of the viewer and figure out what's going on and replicate the things that went well and try and cut the things that didn't go well. Or if you, if you, or you might think, well, no, I'm going to keep that bit that didn't do well for the majority of your audience because for the other 20%, maybe that was the best part. And maybe I want to focus on those people and get them back to the channel. And there's this whole, there are layers and layers of things that you can understand and dissect about social media and lots of choices to make. So yeah, um, having some sort of statistical uh, data analysis is, is useful. 
I think for for me, probably it's presenting most of all. And I guess it probably links into what Christina was saying about kind of basically managing stakeholders, essentially people who are in like in charge of something or other. Um, but I guess certainly with if we do an idea and present it to a client, you know, your work is only as good as you can you can convince the client to run, basically. And um certainly in marketing and advertising is some you know a bit of a phenomenon if you like of what's most impactful might not be the thing that's um most appealing to someone who is in a a marketing role somewhere within an organization for example so um and for understandable reasons because it might be really out there and really effective but the reality is that that's much more like to lose you your job or it's you know it might it might make you millions, but it also m- might make you lose your job. So a safe sort of route is going to feel more comfortable for a lot of people for, for obvious reasons. Um, but you do also live and breathe on like a great portfolio of quite out there work if you do conceptual copywriting. So you do need to get like good work past a client. So being able to present that work, um, obviously you've got to believe that it genuinely is going to work. Um, but if you do then being able to convey that and get someone else excited about it is quite important, I think. Yeah, so, so a lot about communications and, and really understanding, getting under the skin of who your audience is, whether that's through analytics or coming up with ideas, because you understand who you're marketing to and then persuading your client that it's a good idea. There's a lot of those kind of skills that sit around the writing. And so students would be... Um, well-minded to start developing some of those alongside the writing as well. Um, I've got a question for, for Chris. Um, in the, the e-handout, in the biography, you really describe your speech writing um, as if it was a really natural progression from a much more straightforward marketing role. For those that aspire to speech writing in particular, would you recommend your path or is there a quicker route to get there? I can't emphasize enough how much I stumbled into this job. Um, I had no plan. I had, uh, I didn't even know that speech writing was a thing. And all I really cared about was that I got a job where I could write. And one thing just led to another and um, and led me here. So I, I think I really do want to emphasize that, y- you know, you you don't necessarily need a plan. You, you need to recognize opportunities um, and make the most of them. Um, but uh, so I can't I can't necessarily recommend my route. Um, but I think that if someone is is specifically interested in speech writing, from what I can tell, and from people that I've spoken to at speech writing events and so on, um, it's the civil service. It's government. Um, They have a whole structure, they have a whole kind of um, hierarchy of speech writers where you work your way up like six different levels of, you know, junior up to senior. So I think that um, there aren't, and also there aren't a lot of speech writing roles, there aren't a lot of people that need speech writers, not even every vice chancellor. Um, of a university has a speech writer. It, it's it's quite niche and it's it's quite um, unusual to find like a dedicated role like this. Um, but uh, and and I really think that that politics um, you see them advertised a lot looking for speech writers. So I would say if someone specifically wanted this kind of career, I couldn't guarantee how much creativity there'd be in the civil service, but um, that I think would probably be a much more direct trajectory um, to getting to the top, um, you know, doing a political speech writing, for example, and then you could transfer it to other other areas um, as the opportunities arose. Okay, thank you. Um, And a a question for for Christine. Um, You mentioned that you had creative writing as a hobby. Does technical writing give you enough in creative terms or do you still find you have the drive and the energy to carry on writing um, outside of work to satisfy that creative side of you? So I definitely have the drive to continue outside of work and I've been writing stories and novels in my spare time throughout basically, Um, except for at the moment I don't have the energy because I've got two small children. Um, So that's sort of 
dipped a little bit there for a while but um I don't I don't get to exercise my creative muscles in the way that I would like at work like I know I'm not creating stories from nothing I'm not um writing about strange worlds and people real people it's sort of all writing about products and things and so I definitely find that it doesn't scratch the same itch it's it's a good way of making a a steady salary at writing which most creative writing won't get you unless you're very very lucky um but in terms of the creativity I I still write stories outside of work and um I I like doing um national novel writing months um when I can which is a 50,000 words in a month novel writing project which I've done a few times and I really love I'm worse at the editing of my own stuff because once I've written it I I um lose the impetus but uh but yeah the creativity I definitely keep more outside of work than at work thank you thank you very much um a lot of our students naturally think about doing a postgraduate course. It's a sort of natural evolution here that people think, oh, I'll, I'll do a master's or a postgraduate course. And you can find them in, in just about anything these days. Do you think a course in either creative writing or marketing communications would be helpful or required even, or even just give a slight advantage in applications to similar roles? I certainly don't think it could hurt, but I, I don't think it could guarantee anything um, because I think that almost inevitably the writing that you'll be doing in the job that you get will just be different. It will be very specific to that job um, and you might have spent a lot of time on a qualification um, which won't be directly applicable probably, but you know, I don't think it could, I certainly don't think it could hurt. Yeah, I, I haven't, I did an academic master's and then just went straight in. So I can't speak at all from firsthand experience, but um, I know that there are some creative writing courses that people absolutely rave about. Um, I also know that there are advertising courses, for example, which are very prestigious in the industry. And I think maybe that would help get on the first rung, but I can't say that I know that for sure. And the people I know who work in the role, a sort of role like I do, it's all very different career paths. It's all, um, a lot of people have worked in other industries and they come in. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think there are any rules from my point of view. Um, yeah, similarly, I, I, haven't, I haven't done any of those types of courses myself. I did an academic masters as well. So I can't speak to what skills they would build, but I do know in my industry, it's certainly not a requirement. It probably wouldn't help you get your foot in the door in the slightly wild west world of YouTube. <laughs> if someone said, what could I do with one year of my life that would really help me get into the world of YouTube script writing, creating, uh, I would say, start your own YouTube channel, um, build your own presence, connect with other people who are doing a similar thing. Uh, yeah, try to be current. And, and that, that wouldn't even, that could take maybe 10 hours a week. You could be doing another type of work uh, straight out of university. And that would probably be more impressive to most people in the creator economy than, than, than a master's. But uh, there may be niches that I'm overlooking here. Yeah. I would echo that for technical writing. I don't think there's, I mean, creative writing courses aren't going to be directly applicable to anything you're doing as a technical writer. So learning the technical side is probably more valuable if you want to get into it, sort of learning more about computers or software or hardware, if that's the way you want to go. And um, if you wanted to spend a year doing something, then probably learning to code a bit would help because a lot of the documentation I'm writing is for developers. Um, I, I can't code myself but um that disadvantages me in certain types of documentation because it means I don't understand what the developers are trying to get across as easily as if I could write my own program using what they've done um so that kind of the technical side I think is more valuable if you've got the writing from what you've already been doing and you are keen on the writing then that's the side that I would think would be more valuable as a technical writer. Brilliant, thank you. 
Um, a question for you, Grilling. Um, like um, a lot of people on this panel, you started out in, in more straightforward marketing communications. You helped out on the career service website a few years ago and that kind of thing. Um, on your bio, you just kind of said, I, I started work as chief scriptwriter. It was this leap from traditional marketing and suddenly you were this scriptwriter. Was it really that easy? Um, or, you know, how, how did that happen? Yeah, so after I graduated from the MPhil in, in English literature, um, yeah, I, I did freelance work, like you mentioned, for the career service for a communications uh, agency in Cambridge. Um, and the way I got into YouTube, funnily enough, was was um, just by uh, following people on Twitter, looking at YouTube, and this guy uh, that I followed, a guy called Ali Abdal, he was at Cambridge, some people might know him. Uh, he's a YouTuber with about three three million followers, and he makes content about how to study more effectively, productivity, things like this. Uh, he had an ad out saying he was looking for writers, and I thought, "Ha, huh, okay, I never, I didn't know this was a thing, really." But it ticked a lot of boxes in that it was creative, it involved writing, um, it was about something I was interested in already. It paid fairly well. Um, and so I thought, yeah, why, why not? Um, and after getting the job, that was my, I suppose, crash course in all of this stuff. Um, uh, and um, yeah, I suppose that's how I got in. This is not how I would recommend getting a job like mine. I would re what I would recommend is doing what I did, following people that you find interesting, but I would that build up your own portfolio of stuff in whatever way you can um, and uh, try to, uh, yeah, make contacts by maybe replying, uh, messaging with people, um, answering people's questions on Twitter or whatever. Uh, and once you've got enough of a portfolio or enough interest or a following, maybe send some cold emails to people that you find really interesting that you would really like to work with maybe with an example of like hey here is a here's an idea i had for a script i could write for you what do you think something like that uh, a lot of people will ignore you um, especially if they're bigger creators but if they're uh, smaller creators who you uh, vibe with a lot they might they might say hey why not this is this seems interesting and if you write something good then they will probably ask you to Come back and write more things um, so yeah that would that's why i would recommend and is that how you carry on getting work as a as a freelance writer now um so at the moment so if you've worked with one big creator that is very useful because that uh that that shows other people oh this person has worked with that person therefore they must be a fairly decent level mm -hmm. so i mainly get work through People finding me on Twitter or um, just referrals, recommendations, word of mouth, which is which is good. Uh, I've usually found that clients that I get through word of mouth are, um, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't need to build trust because it's already there to some extent. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so a lot of the networking, a lot of being very proactive. But once the snowball starts rolling, um, it, it starts picking up jobs left, right and centre. Excellent. Um, Francesca, you, you mentioned a sort of short, sharp style of passing a copy test. Um, is, is a copy test part of the recruitment process? And if students are more used to writing slightly flowery academic essays, perhaps, um, with a, trying to get up to a word count, um, how can they learn that that shorter, sharper, um, really, really concise style? And are there any resources that you know of that might be useful for that? Yeah, so it is generally part of uh, the selection process for a junior writer role um, at an agency. I think, so you, normally you'd have to, you'd have to present a portfolio of, of stuff that you've already done um, and then, that, and that, to be fair, for a junior role, you could just be things like blogs, for example, are a great thing to put into your portfolio. Um, they want to see writing 
in a practical context and not academic writing at that point. And then you you would generally get a test um, to see how you write. And there are basically, there are rules associated with copy in terms of actually lots of the stuff that we've already talked about. It is about clarity and things. But in terms of the basics, you know, it's stuff like it's very light on adjectives. It's full of powerful verbs. Um, if you've got an Anglo-Saxon word, you use that instead of a long Latin at one. You know, it sounds all quite it is basically quite natural once you get into the flow of it. One of the biggest things you can do is check yourself using the passive. Um, so when you're using is going, et cetera, et cetera, um, trying to bring yourself back to saying really active things. I think from an academic style, when you're starting from an academic standpoint, that can be the thing that's most unnatural is that a lot of, there's a lot of passive in, in that because it's more descriptive as I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, so I guess they're the basics in terms of picking it up. I found books, just books on the subject really good. I mean, a lot of them are super old school though, interestingly. Um, so like Orwell's Six Rules for Writing and they're really, you can read these things super, super quickly. Um, a lot of them, uh, The Elements of Style, William Strunk is quite a good book from this point of view. Um, and then there are more specific ones. So on a copy test, you would probably have to show your ability in certain um, what you'd call more direct um, marketing contexts where um, where you are. It's that where it's performance is measured very strongly. So things like uh, email writing, stuff like that, where you're looking you're looking for direct response, basically. Um, and to learn the ropes on things like that is a good idea. There are certain formats which work better. Um, so sort of the copywriter's handbook, I think, is quite good from that point of view. Um, and then, you know, if you want to find out about advertising more in a more general sense, there are some fun ones which are kind of, you know, Ogilvy on advertising is really good. Um, or Hey Whipple Squeeze This, mad book, but it is is quite good fun. So. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and just before we open to the floor for any questions from the from the students, um, are from all of you, are there any final tips or resources that you can recommend to learn to write in a way that's going to be very useful for a professional writing career? Just any any final final tips? I can I can recommend a great book. Um, there's a chap called Simon Lancaster who I think he's written for. I think you might have written for Tony Blair. Um, he teaches uh, speech writing courses um, and, and I've gone on one of his courses. He's very good, but he's written a book called uh, Speech Writing the Expert Guide. And it's that that's excellent and it's a really easy read. It's a great way to get started. Um, and there's also a professional body called the UK Speech Writers Guild. Um, which is an excellent resource, not just of jobs, but um, all kinds of insight and clips and um, events and so on. And that's run by a chap called Brian Jenner. Um, and so I, I would recommend if you can joining that, um, that will give a tremendous amount of insight and, and maybe some helpful, um, you know, hel helpful suggestions uh, from people on that in that group. Thank you. Um, if you want to do something online, I would re highly recommend. There's a series of blog posts by the um, linguist Gretchen McCullough called. Uh, the first one is called "What Is a Weird Internet Career?" Uh, but the, the the concept is how how to build a weird internet career um, and how this is not really something that will be talked about in most like uh, careers fairs or uh, in, in, in standard uh, careers advice. Um, but it, it is very possible to do and it's really fun once you get started. Yeah, all these are careers that don't tend to turn up in careers fairs. Um, everybody comes at them from different angles. The organizations are sometimes tiny. And they don't do traditional recruitment, so you're you're right. They're not they're not going to turn up in your average careers presentation, which is why we do panels like this. 
Any other tips before we hand over to the student questions? Um, I would just say that actually just on quite a positive note. So I remember someone said to me when I was just about to graduate that actually good writing is quite rare and um, the ability to write really clearly and nicely, which I'm sure partly because of the academic background, lots and lots, you know, everyone is on this call because they can, so, you know, and that is actually quite a rare skill. Um, and it definitely still feels like a rare skill when you get into industry. So just on a positive note, I think these are, they're often wavy career paths, but if you can do it, then, you know, you can find a way, if you know what I mean. Yeah, from listening to you speak, I think one of the things we have in common is you've all sort of wanted to write and fell into a particular career path. And I think there's no sort of specific way. It's just you found something that you loved and went with it. So I think that's the biggest tip is just find something you enjoy doing. And um, absolutely. Um, well, one of the tips from, from yesterday's panel on, on a different subject was just start walking. So you just start in a career that, that involves writing, see where it takes you. You might enjoy it or you might find something out about the way that you like to work and the way that you want to write. And that might take you in all sorts of different directions. So just in, not just start walking, but just start writing and try and find somewhere that you can make a living doing that. Um, I think that that would be really good advice. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions in the chat from students. So um, now is the moment to put them in the chat um, while, if you've got any questions for our panel. Um, I'll kick off with one, which is always a bit of a thorny issue, um, is that students are always a bit worried about money. They're, they're coming out with a lot of student debt. And what sort of salary expectations might there be both at entry level um, and also once they've been established for, for a couple of years and they're, they're starting to get established in different kinds of writing. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just the private sector will probably earn you a lot more. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Sort of specific ranges and I'm part-time so like thinking about my actual salary isn't that helpful and I can't do the maths in my head um but I started out on what I thought was a generous salary um working for a mid-level tech firm um and it's grown slowly but it has grown so um yeah I think I don't know what that would translate to now because that was sort of 15 years ago nearly so it's kind of hard to know yeah. but it, yeah it was it was more than I was fearing and it was yeah it was a good it was a good you amount you live on it yeah 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 comfortably yeah that's good yeah um what I so I think uh, I would approach this uh, I guess I have two things to say first is um if you write online for creators or you are generally for businesses or whatever um Online writing has, I, I don't know if this is the right way of putting it, but infinite leverage. You can write the same blog post or the same email and 10 people could see it or 10 million people could see it. If 10 million people see it, it's worth so much. Um, so if you have an email newsletter that maybe has uh, 100,000 readers, and an open rate of 50%. So every week, 50,000 people click on it and read an email. Um, a sponsorship, someone might pay you 2,500 to 3,000 pounds just for one sponsored slot in that newsletter. And if a creator can, if you can tell someone, hey, I will take care of writing this for you for 10% or 20% of that, they will be like, they will very likely have not had someone else come up to them and say, hey, I can do this for you. And they might just say, okay. Um, so if you can work your way up the ranks to work with bigger people um, and create your own network, there is, there is a lot of money to be made. Um, and yeah, I think, yeah that's, I think that's my, yeah. And my second point would be no matter what, 
you're working what area you're working in i think it's it's very useful to have some sort of side hustle or some way of making money where you are the one negotiating how much you're being paid and you you have clients that can come and go um because i found that once i started doing that i i felt a lot less sort of locked into okay this is how much i'm getting paid because someone else has decided that that's how much i should be getting paid it was more like i get to decide how much it should be and if i charge too much people will go away and if it's yeah i, I would suggest try negotiating stuff for yourself i guess in sort of marketing or advertising agencies it's perhaps a little more set out in some ways well definitely more um than the freelance world but um it, there can be a culture of internships to begin with um which isn't great if i'm honest but you can also get paid roles straight out of the blocks if you sort of do teach yourself the style a bit um and i certainly found that the starting salaries are okay um but it's more it is more of a sort of progression industry and there are because there are very different types of writing even within sort of the bracket of agency copywriter there are very different career progressions and remuneration so like for example pro writing product descriptions on a website would class as copywriting but a lot of that might be a side hustle for some people and you might be paid per word or something like that um but within sort of the agency bracket i think it goes back as well to um the creativity element that um that's been mentioned is that that's where the money is to some extent certainly in in agency in the agency world so there's kind of churn work which is done on quite high scale in a lot of agencies where you're just sort of doing run rate work for, for a lot of big brands um and then the more sort of at the end of advertising you get the higher salaries get as well um people do go out of house they go freelance to make more um but that's generally once people have been established, they they you can be quite in demand just as a freelancer because a lot of writers like their freedom, to be honest. <laughs> and then um, a lot of good writers are out of house and then agencies will go to, to those people because they just know they can write. So I think once you build a reputation, um, you know, you can do you can do well and there is good progression, I think. OK, thank you. Um... At the moment, there are still aren't any questions in the chat from the students. Um, does anybody in the room have any questions for any of our panelists? If you do, just um, pop it in the chat. Can I can I share something while we've got a gap? Because it's something that um, an old line manager said to me, and it was it was a real revelation, and it's really informed how I approach writing. And he said to me. Um, People don't care about facts. What they crave is meaning. And that just has, when, when he said that to me, it just kind of transformed my understanding of what it was I was trying to communicate. Um, and I think if you operate with that principle and, and you see it so much, um, probably in any industry, but you see it in academia where um, we wanna do a um, presentation about, you know, the outcomes of the campaign and it's, slide after slide of like you know bar charts and numbers and and just but what does it mean what does it mean you know people people want to know what is what does it mean and what does it mean for them and and i think that keeping that principle in mind has helped me to pare away so much extra stuff that otherwise would have made it into a speech that that really wasn't needed um if, if you keep um returning your focus to write but what is it what is the meaning what do people need to hear um, what, are, what, are, what have they shown up to hear? What do they want to know deep down? And, um, and that's a principle I just feel can't be stated enough. So that, that this is my gift to all of the people who are attending um, this webinar. And I hope it helps because I think there's a lot to it. Yeah, really, really good advice um, on, on all kinds of writing. Um, rather than putting it in the chat, we have um, a question. Someone's put their hand up, so I'm going to allow them to talk. And Kira, um, fire away with your question. 
if you can. Are you there, Kira? Put your hand up. Have you got a question? Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah. I can now, yeah. That works. Okay. Uh, just to let you know, the chat is disabled uh, for the students. Ooh. That's why there's no questions. Oh, right. Um, okay. Um, yeah, um, I do also have a question though. Um, I'm thinking of starting a blog of my own uh, to do with Formula One, um, but I'm not really sure kind of how to get started, like what platform's are best for blogging, like how to kind of promote things online. Uh, if any of you have any experience with that at all, do you have any advice for getting going? Um, uh, yeah, so currently, uh, I think that the standard advice in, in my neck of the woods would be uh, start a substack. Um, so it, it's essentially like a blog, but it's more like a, it's a newsletter that also functions like a blog. Um, and people can find your blog slash newsletter through searching substack through getting recommendations. Um, you can also put your writing on your own blog and also have it on substack. But I, I would suggest doing that. And I would also suggest uh, having a Twitter presence where you, it's the it's the it's either your name, your Twitter, or the name of your blog, where you post, "Hey, got a new piece on X." Go and interact with other Formula One uh, writers or channels or whatever. Spread your tentacles basically, uh, so that people come and find it, and it's not just this website stuck in the vast ocean of other websites that has no connection to uh, some social system that 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 that's funnels interested people to your content if that helps thank you very much thank you and i hope we've enabled the chat now so thank you for flagging that up So do let us know if we haven't. Um, while, while we're waiting, uh, I, I like Chris, I also have like another uh, wise sentence on writing, which is uh, a, a confused mind always says no. Uh, and it, the, the concept is basically that uh, <laughs> Either people will be compelled by your con will find your content compelling and click through yes or carry on reading or whatever. Usually, people don't stop reading because they disagree with you or they uh, or whatever. They stop reading because they lose track of what it is you're saying or they think it's not relevant or it's just a bit confusing. Um, I think we've all stopped reading stuff or scrolled away or swiped up to the next Instagram real or whatever just because it was confusing we don't we don't understand why it's relevant we don't care mm. uh, and i think that's that's the thing you want to avoid thank you um right we have we have a question come in um from someone who has experience writing in a number of different sectors a personal website with film reviews freelance translation um Bit, freelance translation and that sort of thing does it hinder any future applications if you have such a varied portfolio of writing um she's worried that she might sound a bit erratic because she's got so many different styles in her background um as opposed to being really focused on one area i would definitely say per personally that it wouldn't hinder at all i think it's only beneficial to have written in different contexts obviously when you get to a certain level people want to see consolidated experience in one level but in one sort of area but definitely to begin with I think it's just invaluable to have that kind of variety personally but um I would agree lots of different kinds of experience yeah absolutely yeah, lots of experience writing you're just proving that you can write for different audiences um which will be valuable and that you're flexible in the way that you can write so um i, I don't think it would hold you back at all um we have a question in for Gwilym. um do you have to think about how your writing will interact with music in your work lots of youtube videos have sometimes quite irritating underscore throughout 
And presumably it will be helpful to know what kind of music will be used before you start scripting. Yeah, so uh, on YouTube, there is a, usually a team of people who works on each video. Um, and one of them is the editor. And the editor is crucial. The editor is the, the other writer. Um, uh, if the editor is good, then I kind of know they're going to put good stuff in there and I don't need to think about it too much. Um, with some clients, I will look at the final cut um, of the video and I will say, maybe not this so much. Um, can we, having the music too loud is often a problem. You don't want that. But good editors will do a fantastic job and I won't need to think too much about it. As a, as a follow-up to that, because it's a team effort, if um, the final creation, as it were, if you're not happy with it, and it's your reputation on the line after all because you've scripted it, um, how much say do you have about the final edit if you're not happy? It's, it's, it, you're providing a service to the, to the creator. You're not, you're not, um, you're not telling them how their content should look or feel. You can give them feedback. You can say, I think it would be best like this, but uh, it's just like um, writing a screenplay for a film. You don't get to, unless you're the writer, director, like Quentin Tarantino, you don't get to step in and say how everything should be done. Um, and that's part of your role is to figure out what would work best for the person you're writing for, given their style. Um, and if it doesn't work, then you just learn from that. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, there is another question about YouTube, but I'm not sure I understand it. Um, you mentioned qualities that are specific to YouTube. Could you give details? I'm not sure what those qualities, um, what, I can't sorry. remember what the context for those qualities was. So I'm assuming what, what kind of other writing qualities or specific things you need to think about when you're writing for YouTube. Um, <laughs> Uh, often it's it's about the first 30 seconds, the, the hook. Um, how are you hooking people in? There are various different ways to um, uh, keep, it, keep people interested or um, uh, so, for example, by asking a question and then making it tantalizing enough that people will continue watching. Um, you need to Bear in mind the, the, the title and the thumbnail, so the little picture that people see on YouTube when they click. You've got to bear that in mind when you're scripting your first 30 seconds as well to make sure that you, as they say, like honor the click, that when people have clicked on something, you're showing them, yes, this is indeed what this video is about. Yes. This is not clickbait. Um, yeah, you need to think about those things. There's, there's a lot more besides, but um, that would take a long time to go through. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the next question is about where to look for these kinds of jobs. The um, person posting the question has said specifically for the copywriting advertising sector, but actually it's, it's relevant for all of you. So if you could um, talk a little bit about where jobs might be advertised, if it's appropriate and you don't get them through proactive networking. So we'll start with Frankie. Um, um, so for the, the sort of, role that I do at the kind of agency I work at um campaign is the best site for them often it won't have everything but in terms of understanding what the word copywriting means in that context if it's on campaign that's probably going to be like a creative agency um in a certain way whereas elsewhere you know I mean everyone knows what LinkedIn can be a mess right um in terms of job ads it can be very confusing as to what any of these words mean <laughs> partly because there's often a layer of recruiter between you and the role so it's quite difficult to get a clear picture on the roles um so I would identify certain sites um there are also recruitment agencies that specialize in these kind of roles so um I think it's creative recruitment for example there are certain recruiters that you can see and that they specialize in this kind of role. So you know that if they advertise, um, that's the way I do it when I'm trying to look to move is to understand what this role actually is. It's like a few people you know always advertise this kind of role. Um, technical writing jobs, Christina? Um, so when I've looked, I've generally looked on things like LinkedIn and um, general 
job sites they tend to be fairly because it's big tech companies often hiring technical writers it's fairly mainstream in where you go to find these jobs um if you have a particular company in mind sometimes they advertise stuff on their website first and if you apply through the website it might get a slightly different track but other than that um just a google search for technical writing jobs will generally bring up the kind of thing that i do i think for my for my sort of role um linkedin is good actually um if you're interested in this sort of role in higher ed then jobs.ac.uk um is also very good and as i mentioned the civil service and there's like that dedicated civil service jobs website where you can you know specify uh, writing and communications um so i would say but, but you know speech writing because um that can that's quite specific linkedin is actually really good for that thank you uh, and the civil service one of the fast stream um strands is actually on communication so the, it probably falls under there as well as the entry yeah. the entry routes in i think Gwilym, you already talked about how you how you got into your your way in as well um and there's another question about thank you for all the insights so far um do any of you have agents or know whether agencies are or agents are used for getting this kind of work um or have friends that have agents or know of any of that kind of thing working in your angle on the industry not at all, I'm afraid. I, I, I have no knowledge of that. Um, uh, no, I do not. Um, and generally, yeah, in, in my industry, you're kind of your own agent. Um, an, an agent would, uh, I, I suppose if I think of an agent, it would be someone who takes a cut, mm -hmm. which who doesn't really need to be there in my case. Yeah. Definitely not for technical writing, it's all usually sort of an in-house person there are companies that do technical writing as an outsourced job but that's not the same as having a an agent yeah i, I was i was going to say the same as, as Gwilym. It's, it's a middleman that is going to take a cut of your salary um so if you if you can get it and build your reputation then you will get work on your reputation of being a good writer um a huge thank you to all of our speakers for giving up their time today. Um, it's, it's, I can't tell you how useful it is for students to hear from people actually doing the jobs, what it's really like and answering the questions that they, those burning questions that they really need to know the answers to in order to work out what career they want and whether to follow in your career footsteps. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.